5. The Machines In what respect are desiring machines really machines, in anything more than a metaphorical sense? A machine may be defined as a system of interruptions or breaks, coupures. These breaks should in no way be considered as a separation from reality. Rather, they operate along lines that vary according to whatever aspect of them we are considering. Every machine, in the first place, is related to a continual material flow, heel, that it cuts into. It functions like a ham-slicing machine, removing portions from the associative flow. The anus and the flow of shit it cuts off, for instance, the mouth that cuts off not only the flow of milk, but also the flow of air and sound, the penis that interrupts not only the flow of urine, but also the flow of sperm, each associative flow must be seen as an ideal thing, an endless flux, flowing from something not unlike the immense thigh of a pig. The term hila, in fact, designates the pure continuity that any one sort of matter ideally possesses. When Robert Jolin describes the little balls and pinches of snuff used in a certain initiation ceremony, he shows that they are produced each year as a sample taken from an infinite series that theoretically has one and only one origin, a single ball that extends to the very limits of the universe. Far from being the opposite of continuity, the break or interruption conditions this continuity. It presupposes or defines what it cuts into as an ideal continuity. This is because, as we have seen, every machine is a machine of a machine. The machine produces an interruption of the flow only insofar as it is connected to another machine that supposedly produces this flow. And doubtless this second machine in turn is really an interruption or break too. But it is such only in relation to a third machine that ideally, that is to say relatively, produces a continuous, infinite flux. For example, the anus machine and the intestine machine, the intestine machine and the stomach machine, the stomach machine and the mouth machine, the mouth machine and the flow of milk of a herd of dairy cattle, and then, and then, and then. In a word, every machine functions as a break in the flow in relation to the machine to which it is connected, but at the same time is also a flow itself, or the production of a flow in relation to the machine connected to it. This is the law of the production of production. That is why, at the limit point of all the transverse or transfinite connections, the partial object and the continuous flux, the interruption and the connection, fuse into one. Everywhere there are breaks, flows, out of which desire wells up, thereby constituting its productivity and continually grafting the process of production onto the product. It is very curious that Melanie Klein, whose discovery of partial objects was so far-reaching, neglects to study flows from this point of view and declares that they are of no importance. She thus short-circuits all the connections. Connecticut, connect I cut, cries little Joey. In his study, The Empty Fortress, Bruno Bettelheim paints the portrait of this young child who can live, eat, defecate, and sleep only if he is plugged into machines provided with motors, wires, lights, carburetors, propellers, and steering wheels, an electrical feeding machine, a car machine that enables him to breathe, an anal machine that lights up. There are very few examples that cast as much light on the regime of desiring production and the way in which breaking down constitutes an integral part of the functioning, or the way in which the cutting off is an integral part of mechanical connections. Doubtless there are those who will object that this mechanical, schizophrenic life expresses the absence and the destruction of desire rather than desire itself, and presupposes certain extremely negative attitudes on the part of his parents, to which the child reacts by turning himself into a machine. But even Bettelheim, who has a noticeable bias in favour of Oedipal or pre-Oedipal causality, admits that this sort of causality intervenes only in response to autonomous aspects of the productivity or the activity of the child, although he later discerns in him a non-productive stasis or an attitude of total withdrawal. Hence there is, first of all, according to Bettelheim, an autonomous reaction to the total life experience, of which the mother is only a part. Also, we must not think that the machines themselves are proof of the loss or repression of desire, which Bettelheim translates in terms of autism. 
we find ourselves confronted with the same problem once again. How has the process of the production of desire, how have the child's desiring machines begun to turn endlessly round and round in a total vacuum so as to produce the child machine? How has the process turned into an end in itself? Or how has the child become the victim of a premature interruption or a terrible frustration? It is only by means of the body without organs, eyes closed tight, nostrils pinched shut, ears stopped up, that something is produced, counterproduced, something that diverts or frustrates the entire process of production of which it is nonetheless still a part. But the machine remains desire, an investment of desire whose history unfolds by way of the primary repression and the return of the repressed in the succession of the states of paranoiac machines, miraculating machines, and celibate machines through which little Joey passes as Bettelheim's therapy progresses. In the second place, every machine has a sort of code built into it, stored up inside it. This code is inseparable not only from the way in which it is recorded and transmitted to each of the different regions of the body, but also from the way in which the relations of each of the regions with all the others are recorded. An organ may have connections that associate it with several different flows, it may waver between several functions, and even take on the regime of another organ, the anoretic mouth, for instance. All sorts of functional questions thus arise. What flow to break, where to interrupt it, how and by what means, what place should be left for other producers or anti-producers, the place of one's little brother, for instance. Should one, or should one not, suffocate from what one eats, swallow air, shit with one's mouth. The data, the bits of information recorded and their transmission, form a grid of disjunctions of a type that differs from the previous connections. We owe to Jacques Lacan the discovery of this fertile domain of a code of the unconscious, incorporating the entire chain, or several chains, of meaning, a discovery thus totally transforming analysis. The basic text in this connection is his La Lettre Volée, the purloined letter, but how very strange this domain seems, simply because of its multiplicity. A multiplicity so complex that we can scarcely speak of one chain or even of one code of desire. The chains are called signifying chains, chaînes signifiant, because they are made up of signs. But these signs are not themselves signifying. The code resembles not so much a language as a jargon, an open-ended polyvocal formation, the nature of the signs within it is insignificant, as these signs have little or nothing to do with what supports them. Or rather, isn't the support completely immaterial to these signs? The support is the body without organs. These indifferent signs follow no plan. They function at all levels and enter into any and every sort of connection. Each one speaks its own language and establishes syntheses with others that are quite direct along transverse vectors, whereas the vectors between the basic elements that constitute them are quite indirect. The disjunctions characteristic of these chains still do not involve any exclusion, however, since exclusions can arise only as a function of inhibitors and repressors that eventually determine the support and firmly define a specific personal subject. Note, si Jacques Lacan remarque sur le rapport de Daniel Lagache in écrit of an exclusion having its source in these signs as such being able to come about only as a condition of consistency within a chain that is to be constituted, let us also add that the one dimension limiting this condition is the translation of which such a chain is capable. Let us consider this game of lotto for just a moment more. We may then discover that it is only because these elements turn up by sheer chance within an ordinal series, in a truly unorganized way, that their appearances makes us draw lots. End note. No chain is homogeneous. All of them resemble, rather, a succession of characters from different alphabets in which an ideogram, a pictogram, a tiny image of an elephant passing by, or a rising sun, may suddenly make its appearance in a chain that mixes together phonemes, morphemes, etc., without combining them. Papa's moustache, Mama's upraised arm, a ribbon, a little girl, a cop, a shoe, suddenly turned up. Each chain captures fragments of other chains from which it extracts a surplus value, 
just as the orchid code attracts the figure of a wasp. Both phenomena demonstrate the surplus value of a code. It is an entire system of shuntings along certain tracks, and of selections by lot, that bring about partially dependent, aleatory phenomena bearing a close resemblance to a Markov chain. The recordings and transmissions that have come from the internal codes, from the outside world, from one region to another of the organism, all intersect, following the endlessly ramified paths of the great disjunctive synthesis. If this constitutes a system of writing, it is a writing inscribed on the very surface of the real, a strangely polyvocal kind of writing, never a bi-univocalized, linearized one, a transcursive system of writing, never a discursive one, a writing that constitutes the entire domain of the real inorganization of the passive syntheses, where we should search in vain for something that might be labeled the signifier, writing that ceaselessly composes and decomposes the chains into signs that have nothing that impels them to become signifying. The one vocation of the sign is to produce desire, engineering it in every direction. These chains are the locus of continual detachments, schizzes on every hand that are valuable in and of themselves, and above all must not be filled in. This is thus the second characteristic of the machine, breaks that are a detachment, coupure détachement, which must not be confused with breaks that are a slicing off, coupure prélèvement. The latter have to do with continuous fluxes and are related to partial objects. Schizzes have to do with heterogeneous chains, and as their basic unit use detachable segments or mobile stocks resembling building blocks or flying bricks. We must conceive of each brick as having been launched from a distance and as being composed of heterogeneous elements, containing within it not only an inscription with signs from different alphabets, but also various figures, plus one or several straws, and perhaps a corpse. Cutting into the flows, le prélèvement du flux, involves detachment of something from a chain, and the partial objects of production presuppose stocks of material or recording bricks within the coexistence and the interaction of all the syntheses. How could part of a flow be drawn off without a fragmentary detachment taking place within the code that comes to inform the flow? When we noted a moment ago that the schizo is at the very limit of the decoded flows of desire, we meant that he was at the very limit of the social codes, where a despotic signifier destroys all the chains, linearizes them, by univocalizes them, and uses the bricks, as so many immobile units, for the construction of an imperial Great Wall of China. But the schizo continually detaches them, continually works them loose and carries them off in every direction in order to create a new polyvocity that is the code of desire. Every composition, and also every decomposition, uses mobile bricks as the basic unit. Diaschesis and diaspasis, as Monokov put it. Either a lesion spreads along fibers that link it to other regions, and thus gives rise at a distance, to phenomena that are incomprehensible from a purely mechanistic, but not a machinic, point of view, or else a humoral disturbance brings on a shift in nervous energy and creates broken, fragmented paths within the sphere of instincts. These bricks or blocks are the essential parts of desiring machines from the point of view of the recording process. They are at once component parts and products of the process of decomposition that are spatially localized only at certain moments, by contrast with the nervous system, which is a great chronogenous machine, a melody-producing machine of the music box type with a non-spatial localization. What makes Monokov and Morgu's study an unparalleled one, going far beyond the entire Jacksonist philosophy that originally inspired it, is the theory of bricks or blocks, their detachment and fragmentation, and above all, what such a theory presupposes the introduction of desire into neurology. The third type of interruption or break characteristic of the desiring machine is the residual break, cupurest, or residuum, which produces a subject alongside the machine, functioning as a part adjacent to the machine. And if this subject has no specific or personal identity, 
if it traverses the body without organs, without destroying its indifference, it is because it is not only a part that is peripheral to the machine, but also a part that is itself divided into parts that correspond to the detachments from the chain, détachement de chaîne, and the removals from the flow, prélèvement du flux, brought about by the machine. Thus, this subject consumes and consummates each of the states through which it passes, and is born of each of them anew, continuously emerging from them as a part made up of parts, each one of which completely fills up the body without organs in the space of an instant. This is what allows Lacan to postulate and describe in detail an interplay of elements that is more machinic than etymological, parer, to procure, séparer, to separate, se, parer, to engender oneself. At the same time, he points out the intensive nature of this interplay. The part has nothing to do with the whole. It performs its role all by itself. In this case, only after the subject has partitioned itself does it proceed to its parturition. That is why the subject can procure what is a particular concern to it here, a state that we would label a legitimate status within society. Nothing in the life of any subject would sacrifice a very large part of its interests. Like all the other breaks, the subjective break is not at all an indication of a lack or need, manque, but on the contrary a share that falls to the subject as a part of the whole, income that comes its way as something left over. Here again, how bad a model, the edible model of castration is. That is because breaks or interruptions are not the result of an analysis. Rather, in and of themselves, they are syntheses. Syntheses produce divisions. Let us consider, for example, the milk the baby throws up when it burps. It is at one and the same time the restitution of something that has been levied from the associative flux. Restitution de prélèvement sur le flux associatif. The reproduction of the process of detachment from the signifying chain. Reproduction de détachement sur la chance signifiant and a residuum, résidu, that constitutes the subject's share of the whole. The desiring machine is not a metaphor. It is what interrupts, and is interrupted in accordance with these three modes. The first mode has to do with the connective synthesis, and mobilizes libido as withdrawal energy, énergie de prélèvement. The second has to do with disjunctive synthesis and mobilizes the noumen as detachment energy, énergie de détachement. The third has to do with the conjunctive synthesis and mobilizes voluptus as residual energy, énergie résiduelle. It is these three aspects that make the process of desiring production at once the production of production, the production of recording, and the production of consumption. To withdraw apart from the whole, to detach, to have something left over, is to produce, and to carry out real operations of desire in the material world. <laughs>